The key to high quality then always is going to be what you're doing inside the classroom. So namely, it's that I want you to think about the interactions between you and the kids in your classroom and between the kids in your classroom. Because all learning really comes with what you choose to do. What you're going to want to do, and you can always do, is be very thoughtful about the materials you choose. And advocating that you need materials if they are needed, right? So because preparing the environment is essential to what's going to happen next. And this could also be saying I need to add things or take away things if it's impeding you know, kids' ability to do something. You can provide sufficient previous experience and information which is getting to the point about the, the knowledge coming in. You can't just set up a center and expect kids to be able to do it. If I set out the math manipulatives and I don't explain how I can use these counting bears to teach number sense, but I don't know how to use them, then I'm not going to use them appropriately. If you want self-sustaining centers in your classroom, because you can't be everywhere, so you've got to have some centers in your classroom that kids can just do it on their own. So this might mean having a whole group discussion about how do we use these new materials, but you've got to make sure that you're providing them enough, know that they have enough information and context to be able to use it effectively. You've got to provide them enough time and space. This is a hard one because as rightfully pointed out, we don't always have the time and space. And a lot of that is never under our control, right? Lunch is always going to happen in the kindergarten classroom at like 10 o'clock in the morning because <laughs> You just have to go first, right? It just seems to be the way it always is. And so those are things that, you know, you've got to figure out what can I control and what can I not, and trying to figure out how do you have enough time and space. And it's kind of hard because those first moments of the day tend to be the most productive for kids, and you don't always have the luxury of being able to have that time available for you to teach what you want to teach. So just take comfort in knowing that you can't, not everything's under your control, but try to figure out how you can, where you can and what you can, you can have control over, how do you provide that time and space for them. Uh, you want to think about how you can use the least obtrusive approach to support learning. So if a lot of this is we want to give kids agency, we want to give them the opportunity to be hands-on and authentic in their learning, we need to back off. And we've got to think about what is, what is something small and incremental I can do to kind of push them towards that goal as opposed to just being as controlling as possible. But again, that takes time because a lot of times they're not going to get there on your timetable. And then the other thing you want to do, which was rightfully picked up at the beginning of it, is the assessment piece. You want to observe kids so that you know that they're meeting those markers that you think are important. You want to assess their learning and you want to try to do so in a, as playful a way as possible. And you want to extend their thinking in a respectful way. We don't ever say kids are wrong. They're constructing knowledge. They're constructing an understanding. So we want to think that you might have said something wrong, but can I find a nugget of something that's right in what you said? And then I extend that. And I can extend your thinking. So we mentioned the observation and assessment. That's a key piece. So if you went through our program at UNH, we teach you a lot about how to take photographs and create little documentations. And there's actually some really great apps out there that are free for schools to use where you can create like your own classroom Twitter feed that is targeted just to your families. And that's a great way to do documentation so that your families link in, they have it, they see only the pictures you tag with their kid or to the whole school and you can write little captions in. You could do the paper-based system. But creating like taking photographs and documenting what kids are doing is a great form of assessment. I love it when my my uh, my sister-in-law came home with her portfolio book at the end of the year for her son. She was so proud of that book that showed works of their progress over the course of the whole year. Right? So they could see as a parent, look, this was the, the first thing that they wrote in the class, and look at the last thing that they wrote in the class. So that progress over time is a great documentation. All those pictures that they write and they make and they draw, that's documentation. A lot of things are tangible like that, but a lot of things are not. So that's when photographs are really helpful because they're making something that, you know, I can't document your problem solving on the like, you know, the playground, but I can take a short little video on my cell phone and load that up to like a course website for my family. So think about that as a great way to do observation and assessment that makes it a little bit more playful. 
You can have kids start, I mean, they all know how to use cell phones now, right? If you've got it, they might make videos of themselves. That's another great form of documentation as opposed to just writing. Uh, you want to think about how you can both use non-directive and directive statements. So when you're guiding this and you're providing those scaffolds, you want to sometimes be very direct. Like, let's find something else on the playground that can help us get that bottle out of the fence. Or, you know, let's come up and write down a plan of the questions we might ask the construction workers about what's happening on their side of the street. So it can be very directive, or it can be non-directive. So I want to ask and provide a cue that's more open-ended. So it could just be providing a really good inferential question, like, well, do you guys have any other ideas of how we can can get the bottle out of the wall. So we want to think about that sometimes we want to be very specific and that's really helpful being very directive when we've got that learning goal in mind that we want to push them towards but we might be not less directive when we're trying to engage in more kind of those exploratory developmental skills. Okay, questions. How to ask a good question. This is really the bane of my existence. Like I sit down with my nephew and I'm like let's have a conversation. And trying to get that beyond just a one-turn conversation where they actually, he actually gives me some feedback after that I can give back to him. Like that give and return is so important but so hard. And I find that one of the most difficult things I do when I talk to kids is really thinking about how to ask a good question. Because why questions? Little kids love to ask why questions. Why is the sky blue? Well, what's, why is that man doing that? Why are you making me sit down and have dinner now? Why are you having this thing? But they're really hard for young kids to answer. So asking a kid, well, why did you do that? Well, that's, not, that's actually kind of hard. That's a very internal thing. But you could say, can you show me what you did again? Like, act it out for me. You might not have to be able to articulate it, but act it out. Or can you show your friend what you did? That might be something to get them to thinking about that cognitive process without being able to have to answer that question. So thinking about asking good questions, and I'll give a slide on that in a second, is really hard, but so important in this kind of open-ended, child-directed environment. Because that's how we're going to guide the instruction in particular in making something move from being just free play to being more of that mutual guided play, is asking good questions. Uh, we're going to have to model and we're going to demonstrate. If I want a center to be self-sustaining, where the kids can do their own free play child directed exploration, but yet reach it towards a goal I want them to get to, I have to model and demonstrate how to use those materials effectively. And then we also want to think about how we might actually physically intervene. Sometimes we use our words, and other times we want to change the environment. So this could be actually involved like adding or taking away materials. So if they're always solving that problem with one solution, Let's take away that solution and see if they can come up with another way to solve that problem. So we do this all the time when we're instructing and kind of the more, you know, there's a lot of ways to think about adding, right? That we can learn to add from things from top to bottom or we can add from left to right. We can think about uh, using our 10 frames. There's a lot of different ways in which we can engage in math. And we always want to think about providing kids a lot of different ways of solving the solution. And so that's the same thing that we're doing here. You're trying to come up with ways to get them to develop an understanding of what's happening. It's not just superficial. It's that construction of knowledge. And so we want to always think about how we can tweak the things we're doing in order to make them think a little bit more comprehensively about something, which is really hard. Honestly, all these things are really hard to do, which is why I think teachers are so like underappreciated sometimes, because this is a hard thing. You're having to do this for 20 little kids, or 24 little, 25 little kids in a classroom setting. And so you're constantly having to think and reflect and evaluate. But it's these kinds of things that no matter what curriculum you're teaching or what approach you're teaching under or what philosophy you use that are going to be essential to helping kids. And it's even more important in this kind of play-based setting. Okay. So let me give some example of kind of respectful commentary and questioning that you might want to just kind of ping in because this is so important. You can pro, 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 ugh, propose a problem uh, to kids. So you might just say, well, what would happen if? 
what would happen if, you know, I, you know, hurt myself? Like I fell down on the playground. What would you do to help me? What would you do if? What would you do if um, the, I'm trying to think. What's something else off the top of my head? I'm drawing a blank here. What if I um, needed to get that tower to be taller than your head? But it keeps falling over when it's narrow, right? So what would we have to do to make it taller? Propose a question or a problem for them to solve. You can add, just make leading statements. Well, have you considered and try to, and then add in something? So they're trying to solve the bottle getting out of the wall problem, right? So have you considered going over the top of the fence instead of through the fence? And then just see where they go with it. You can have them think of possibilities. So what would happen if? So if I'm playing the game where I'm trying to figure out where things will either soak or they'll, uh, they'll float or they'll sink, I might just ask the question, well, what would happen if I stuck this ball in the water? Do you think it will explode or will you sink, right? That's getting them towards that, right? Or what would happen if I put the rock on top of the boat that's floating? Do you think the boat's gonna float or do you think it's gonna sink with the rock on top, right? I could add in things to think of different possibilities. And then you could ask them to clarify their thinking. So I said why questions are could be hard, so why did you do that or what are you, you know, are you thinking that? But you can just have them tell me what you're thinking. Can you say out loud, do a think aloud with them. Can you say out loud what it is you're doing when you're doing it to have them explain? Or just ask them, well, how did you get there? Like, how did you get this from there to there? How did you get that answer, right? Have them walk through it with you. Because those are the kind of things that are really going to get them not just thinking about getting to the answer, but the process of getting to that answer. 